。拥有超过十二年游戏行业经验的 Jimmy Smith 在育碧和一点公司工作数年，参与过多项三 A 产品开发制作。他倡导创意界的知识共享，是一位系统性导向的游戏策划。接下来就有请 Sumo Digital 首席游戏策划 Jimmy Smith 与我们分享他的项目经验——协同文化中的策划感知力。Hello, my name is Jamie Smith. I'm a principal game designer at Sumo Sheffield, and、uh, this is my talk: design sensibilities for a collaborative culture.、Um, so, a little bit of background about me:、um, I've been in games for about twelve years now. About a third of that time has been at Sumo Digital, but the last four years or so, I've worked at nine titles.、Um, you know, mostly AAA kind of focused titles.、Um, so, originally, these were at Ubisoft. You know, the driver for San,、Fri uh, San Francisco franchise. Um, the crew, and then more recently on the division. Before I moved to EA, working on the FIFA games, and then most recently at, at Part Sumo、uh, Newcastle, helping out on Hood Outlaws and Legends and Call of Duty Vanguard. And I'll provide more context as I go through this talk、um, on some of these examples.、Um, so the reason why I show this stuff is because much of what I'm about to chat about、um, focuses on lots of different teams that have been involved in lots of different projects. Established franchises, you know, different platforms, small teams, large teams, big prototypes, you know, large scale games, regional and internationally. So, Call of Duty was made with the team that was in Australia and also in、uh, Foster City on the west coast、uh, of US, you know, across different time zones and so on.、Um, and the reason why I mention all these things is because it feeds into、uh, the context is that every single team I've been involved in, things always change. You know, nothing is ever the same.、Um, Things can you know can can be taken from one project to another, but at the same time the team is different, the scope of the project is different, the genre is different, and so on. Um, so the 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 kind of feed line for the talk is,、uh, what universal approaches can be taken to foster collaborative culture between mixed discipline peers, irrespective of team size, location, and project scope. Um, so you know what you're about to see is a bunch of suggestions that I have for you know handling this. Um. Regardless of what project you're kind of involved in, but I should say that this is mostly、uh, AAA focused, and it assumes that there is face-to-face -face contact or video calls in kind of a you know hybrid working scenario. Um, so the overview,、uh, just before we head into the main body of the talk, is that generally speaking, good judgment、uh, comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. You know that old kind of proverb. And a lot of what I'm about to say is based on you know my personal experience or the experiences of you know firsthand. I've been in the meeting, but maybe it wasn't necessarily、um, that directly applicable to me. Everything I'm about to mention、uh, could be described as pragmatic common sense. So you shouldn't really be surprised that anything that I'm about to mention here. It's mostly just that、um, they are. Things that anybody can kind of implement, and also you probably know this stuff already. It's just that people probably don't.、Um, <clears throat> they probably don't implement this stuff or practice this stuff as much as they might preach it. And the talk itself is split into three areas: so the leader, the team, the project.、Um, when I've done this talk previously, there's been a good split of maybe a fifty-fifty split of designers and non-designers who are interested in this kind of subject matter. And it's been split up in this way to ensure that hopefully there's value for everybody. And finally, timely anecdotes and analogies. So everything that I'm about to go through is based on you know previous experience. The timely kind of part relates to certain things that I'm about to mention are relevant at different stages of the project, and there is a diagram on each of the pages that represents that. So for the main meat of the talk,、uh, we'll start with the first section, which is about the leader. Um, so the leader is effectively the focal point of the team. In teams that I've been on previously, normally being a feature team, a feature team of mixed discipline peers, and generally speaking, it's been the designer who's been the head of that team.、Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a designer. It's just whoever is effectively the linchpin or the person who's you know determining what the team is going to work on. So everything starts with intent and goals. You know, you're effectively setting the course, much like the picture that's on screen here. You know, you're going out into the wilderness, but you can kind of see where you're going, but you kind of can't quite see exactly past it. The main point is that you're heading in a given direction, and you'll decide kind of what to do next when you kind of get there. But whether that comes from kind of design direction, whether that comes from you know previous experience of a project and what you want to do next,、um, the main thing is is that every single project should start with intent and goals. And the other side of this is,、um, unless you have clear intent and goals, you're going to have a team that's pretty rudderless. They they might be heading in different directions. 
equally on the other side of that, if you are too strict with your intent and goals, there'll be a lack of autonomy uh, within the team. So it's just to keep this in mind, because everything going forward from this point in this presentation assumes that you have a clear direction of what you want to achieve. Um, so the next one is about the number three. Uh, so three is the magic number. Um, three, you'll tend to see in a lot of different games, a lot of different areas. Um, three is in the number of perk trees that you might have with characters. It might be the number of characters you have in the game. But also it feeds into collaboration as well. You know, three is within the Fab Fibonacci sequence. It's used a lot for, you know, pr production and so on. Um, but also it's a nice succinct number to keep in mind, you know, the top three priorities on a given project. You might also notice that, uh, you know, human cognitive load, generally speaking, most people can, you know, remember between three to seven things at any given time, and three is at the lower end of that. Um, and just uh, with, the, with the number three in mind, you'll see the diagrams that are on each of the screens, the, the little wheel uh, that, that's below the text. Um, the wheel represents, number one is kind of the start of the project, you know, what people might call ideation phase or pre-production. Number three represents kind of, you know, the final hurdle, you know, this is just before submission, just before release. And two is kind of the bit in between. So for most people, that would be, you know, production uh, pretty much. So each of these slides has a diagram that represents roughly, you know, when this stuff is kind of applicable. And as I say, the number three is useful at all times, pretty much, especially when it comes to things like the top three priorities or that, you know, the, what the most important things we should be working on at any given time. Um, marginal innovation. So this is another topic um, that that is you know quite dear to my heart because it's something that I'm quite interested in on any project. And this is just the idea of you're taking something that already exists. You know maybe out, it's out in the markets, depending on what type of game that you're going to be working on, and it's effectively trying to level up the quality of that feature in some way or bring something new to the table. So for example, in our case, this is from Hood Outlaws and Legends. I'll provide some context for these games as I go through. But it's a, it's a bow and arrow kind of focus game. Um, it's a multiplayer team-based um, heist. You've got to sneak into a castle, sneak in, steal the gold, and then get out. So one of the characters, who's our, our Robin Hood uh, style character, he has a bow and arrow. It's all about ranged combat. But you already have games on the market such as you know Horizon, Assassin's Creed, The Last of Us, um, Tomb Raider. All of these games already have exceptional kind of bow mechanics. So why would we do something, you know, completely different to them when at the time we had a much smaller team, uh, a much more, you know, kind of moderate kind of budget, and we have to make the best use of what we've got. So trying to emulate kind of what they did in the first instance is a difficult task enough. But the next thing is kind of what do you bring to the table on top of that? So standing on the shoulders of the giants. Um, so for us, we were one of the first games that were on PS5 uh, to use the new DualSense controller for, for bow and arrow mechanics. So the feeling of you know how it feels to pull a bowstring and fire an arrow. Um, the 3D audio. So we have wisps that kind of go past your ear. Um, so if, if, if there's a nearby shot, you can tell exactly what direction it come from. And we also have other things, which is um, we made it much easier to shoot targets in the distance than we did up close um, with the bow and arrow you know, physics um, to make it feel like you can get the super sniper shots. And you know the, the satisfaction of the headshot was, was pretty, uh, pretty nice as well. So all of those are things that we kind of brought to the table on top of leveraging you know, what other games had already done. Um, so form follows function. So this is just the idea that whenever it comes to providing work for people, it's about defining the list of functions first. Um, so the image that's on screen, this is from Call of Duty Vanguard. And in this particular mission, you're playing as a character that's the explosive specialist. Um, so this is the person who, you know, carries grenades, carries C4 and, you know, all of those kind of things. The idea is, is that we wanted to introduce a new behavior in the game that would deal with the following functions. So, you know, it's applicable only to lethal grenades. It's something that's minimal uh, for the player. So some, something that suggests that to the player, like where the grenade is going to go, but it's minimal uh, aesthetic, you know, it doesn't get in the way of what they're doing. Um, it would suggest the throw trajectory, potentially signifying impacts and ending locations. Um, the time to danger as well. So normally a grenade would have a cup time and if you hold it for too long, it would explode. And also it could be used as a tutorial and in the multiplayer. So if you use this, um, that, that line that's in the middle of the screen, if you use that line in multiplayer, you can use things to bounce uh, grenades off the walls as part of a perk. Now, all of those things I've just mentioned, they're all the functions. And the form of that is exactly what you see on screen, which is it's a white trail line that feeds into the distance that shows where the grenade is going to land. 
it signifies the danger so that the the line will turn red as as it's uh, getting close to explode you'll also see the text on screen that's at the top and uh, kind of the middle this is basically a tutorial it's a first time tutorial for the player to throw a grenade that to, to land it into the tank so it kind of teaches this new mechanic so that's an already existing behavior that was in the game with a bunch of new functions but the form that took was that it's just kind of ui work i mean it's it's playing down the the investment from that but we didn't necessarily need 10 different types of throw animations. We didn't need five barks, you know, audio barks for every single time that you throw the grenade. All we really needed was a UI just to signify all of the functions that were above. So we're not necessarily trying to create an excessive amount of work for people. We're just trying to do exactly what's needed for the function of this feature. Um, so the next one is about elegance and simplicity. So it's just that old idea, I think it's from uh, Shikaru Maimato, just the idea that a good idea is something that does not solve just one single problem, but solves many problems at once. Um, so Hood Outlaws and Legends, again, this is uh, our Robin character, he's in a sniper tower, and you'll see to the left-hand side, there's a blue explosion. Uh, explosion. This is from his explosive arrow, which is one of his core kind of abilities. But previously, that wasn't the case. He used to have a standard uh, dash kind of behavior, you know, dash from A to B. Um, but in terms of the problems that we'd encountered, uh, you know, before this point was we weren't actually using the character's weapon for his special ability, um, and, and that didn't really empower the cover star. Uh, we have a sheriff character who I'll mention later on, but it's a bit like Mr. X from Resident Evil. He's very difficult to take down, and he kind of patrols the map. We have another character in the game, which is more like our little John from the uh, from the you know the old Robin Hood kind of folklore. He's also extremely difficult to kill when it's in his ability because it's more like a berserker kind of rage mode. The other one is that Robin could not kill multiple people at once. Only one arrow would kill one person. Um, so there was a one to cut one ratio. There was no way with Robin to kill multiple people at a single time. And there was nowhere to sell the power of the arrows as well, because it was a single arrow. You know, there was no other options that you currently had. Um, and also we had this tactic, which was called meat shielding. So this was the idea that as you're taking the treasure chest, which is in the bottom center of the image, you're taking the treasure chest to the end zone. You, the teammates of the opponent team would crowd around the treasure carrier and it would be extremely difficult to stop them from escaping. Every single thing that I've just mentioned was dealt with in one fell swoop when we introduced the explosive arrow. You could kill multiple people in one go. You could have different hit reactions. So the feeling of getting hit by an explosive arrow versus a standard arrow is, is very clear in terms of animations. You could kill the, the kind of the rage mode characters. You could kill the sheriff who's almost unkillable. And also it was used uh, as a as a the turning point in the marketing trailer for the game originally as well. Um, the, the the enemy team pulls out an explosive arrow and then that's when, you know, all help kind of breaks loose. Now, minimum change, maximum impacts. Um, this is another one just in terms of, you know, trying to keep things as minimal as possible. Um, so when we worked on Call of Duty, one of the ideas was to make it so that you could be mean it could have a much more meaningful you know consideration of your shots for every single bullet fired so the idea being in previous call of duties it would be more like rambo you would constantly fire bullets you wouldn't really think about your ammo count you wouldn't really be considerate of your bullets but the idea here was was to take something make a single change where, where we could and basically reduce um, you know, the amount of ammo that was in the game to have the largest possible impact, which was you know, to, to, to make it uh, feel much more considerate of your bullets. Now, the reason I mention this one is because before we did this on the game, we were actually thinking about what is the one single change that we could make that would give the biggest impact. If you wanted to care about your ammo, what would be the one thing you would change to, uh, to kind of make it meaningful? So we reduced the ammo count across the game, but on top of that, because uh, that was the main uh, change that we needed to do, but on top of that, um, we were trying not to make work for extra people. Now, the, the benefit of Call of Duty is that they have all these systems kind of historically in terms of their ammo counts, in terms of their animations, in terms of their weapons. So all we had to do was change a single number and everything else would just work almost like magic. And that's exactly what you see on screen kind of in there. There's bolt action rifles, a, a very, very powerful in terms of their shots, but you have much less ammo, so therefore you're much more considerate about what you're shooting on the battlefield. But at the same time, we're trying to make the minimum change that has the biggest impact on the gameplay, but ideally 
doesn't provide additional work for other people yeah, to, to do. And this was a good example of where it worked out, you know, predominantly because of this franchise having um, such good support in terms of their animations and gun behaviors. And the last one for this section is just a, a we before me kind of mindset. Um, the idea being is that, you know, you're not necessarily developing a game in a vacuum. You're working alongside other people. It's not about kind of egos. It's not about trying to push your agenda or push your ideas forward. It's just be mindful that the contribution of everybody is, is just as meaningful as anybody else. And especially that design alone can't make an exceptional game. You know, you, you need the rest of the team. And a quick summary for this section. So provide three clear goals, uh, goals to innovate underappreciate features. Um, I added the underappreciated part because that's one of the things I actually find quite beneficial is if you go or you target features that are often overlooked or underappreciated, you tend to get a lot more value over something in that kind of a zone where it hasn't been, you know, kind of looked at maybe for the past five, 10 or 15 years that then you would, for example, to um, try and innovate upon something that every single game is doing. Um, focus on minimalism, keep an eye on the creative ingredients. So again, Try to add things to the game, but just be mindful that anything that you do add to the game um, could create more work for other people. And, and also it could stifle the, the gameplay experience as well. And also being a great teammate is, being, you know, is always better than being a great designer or any discipline uh, for that matter. So this is for the team. Um, so the first section was all about the leader, you know, the person who's the linchpin. This is about the team that's around that kind of leader. And, and it also includes the leader itself. Um, in teams I've been involved in, this has normally been a mixed discipline team working together um, to provide something of value. So the first one is just to embrace the unfamiliar. Um, so quite often as you move from project to project, as you move from team to team, you might find that some people might be a bit wary or a bit hesitant, um, you know, based on what they're moving on to. If they've been working on a, an open world game for many years, for example, you know, ultimately, you just have to take a leap of faith if you're moving from an open world game into you know a driving game or you're moving from a driving game into a fighting game. You get the same kind of situation crops up when you move in between engines, you know, game engines going from one to another. It's just that you've got to start with, you know, the team itself has to start with embracing the kind of challenge or being open to new ideas um, or else that's always going to be a difficult kind of conversation later on, um, you know, as, as you get further into development. Um, so next one is about listening first, talking last, and this is specifically about kind of meeting etiquette. Um, just when I mentioned earlier, you know, face-to-face -face meetings or video calls, I bet many people have probably been in a call where you tend to find that one person dominates the conversation or, you know, the person who seems to have the most experience is the one that everybody looks to to kind of speak first. But generally speaking, I, can, I often find it's more beneficial to let the quieter voices in the room or the less experienced folk to kind of talk first because they get to put their ideas across. And an even better version of that is once everybody's put their ideas into the pot, the final person, which might be the focal point of the leader of the team, brings those ideas together into, you know, what are the next steps? So, you know, what are we going to take from this conversation? So it's almost like a summary uh, rather than the person adding the ideas in the first place. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, it's just to be mindful of the voices that are in the room and provide everybody the opportunity to get their kind of say, um, especially if it's more inexperienced or quieter people within the room. Uh, the next one is about yes and. So this is basically just about having an optimistic or a positive kind of mindset, um, especially when you're in kind of design meetings, maybe you're in cross-discipline kind of chats or um, discussing or reviewing a feature. It can be quite easy for people to shoot down an idea or to say that's not going to work because or that, that won't behave that way because we tried it in the past and, you know, it, it didn't work out for us. Ultimately, it's just about having a yes and kind of mindset. Um, you don't necessarily have to say the words yes and, but it's more about trying to add to ideas, trying to plus them, try to be more of an optimist. When somebody says something, yes, that's cool, and we could also do this, you know, and we could also do that. So it's basically trying not to, if you can, shoot down ideas immediately. But what you can do is have one round of ideas where you're trying to gather them. And then the second round of ideas is basically trying to, you know, shrink it down into the ones that you're going to focus on. And that might be based on feasibility. It might be based on the skill sets within a team. It could be based on a number of other factors. 
So uh, the next one, this is kind of a twofold set of slides, but it's the idea of agreeing on the ambition. And in the second part I'll come to is disagreeing on the details. So if you think about the ambition, it's like this mountain that's in the background. That's where you want to get to. Generally speaking, the team should kind of rally around that idea. The team should kind of try and support wherever the direction is, wherever the intent is, wherever the goals are, and try to be rigid with that goal and, you know, sticking with it. And the second part, just when I mentioned about disagreeing on the details, it's more about basically starting to question how you actually get to that location. You know, do you want to barrel straight through the woods? Do you want to go to the left? Do you want to go to the right? It's all an analogy, but the idea is, is that you're still trying to get to the same destination. You're just being flexible about how you get there. And it also means that for people on the team, um, if you disagree too much on the big things, Generally speaking, people might find you more of an abrasive kind of personality or you're quite difficult in, in terms of, you know, trying to get ideas uh, through, through, through gates or, you know, through, through the gauntlet, as, as, so to speak. The way I would suggest to go about this is keep, keep saying yes with the ideas and, you know, keep on board with what the goals are, but disagree on the smaller things to build up your own kind of internal credit. And once you've got enough of those kind of credits, then you could start to disagree on some of the larger things or maybe, you know, maybe a larger decision will eventually go your way. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, just try not to, you know, derail the conversation, try not to derail the goals, but try and support how you're going to get there, but provide alternate kind of options where you can. Uh, the next one's about the 3090 feedback. So this is the idea about, um, you know, this was inspired from combats that was in Hood Outlaws and Legends. Um, so the image that you can see, this is from the combat that's in the game. Um, you can see multiple guards in the picture who's getting hit by our character, which was based on Friar Tuck. And the idea here is, is that um, in the very first version of the game, it did not look like this. The image that's on screen is in the final released version of the game. But in the very first version, we had kind of rudimentary animations. We had the standard Unreal Mannequin kind of character. Everything was pretty basic. To the point of where, you know, when we had a playtest, it was pretty confusing to us that the feedback that we got in a playtest compared that our rudimentary, our very first version of the game to something like God of War, which had just been released at that time. Very high profile experience kind of team, um, lots of, you know, really high budget, really high quality kind of production values. And we were getting our our initial prototype compared to that as if it was a final kind of game, uh, which, you know, was kind of unfair at best. So this is where the 3090 feedback comes in, whereby, you know, if you think of 30 and 90 as, as percentages, 0% represents kind of nothing. You know, the idea doesn't exist whatsoever. 100% is what you see on screen. 100% is the game that's on the shelf. So 30% and 90% represents kind of the first pass, almost like the foundation of the game. And the 90% is almost like the final push. So this is like, you know, you're on the you're on the tail end of the project. You know, everything's looking pretty good at this point. The idea being is that your feedback should be tailored to one of those two things. Either it's a very early phase or it's something right at the end. You know, you, you're really scrutinizing every single pixel that's on the, on the, uh, on the game. So for example, in Hood Outlaws and Legends, um, it's a multiplayer game. So all we really care about at the 30% kind of stage is, can you hit a target consistently? And over the network is what I see the same as what you see. Um, so basically those are the only two things, you know, in the first instance, can you target things, you know, correctly? Um, when you push the button, does it respond, you know, sufficiently enough and so on. That's the kind of the basics. The 90% is all of the stuff like, you know, what color are the particle effects? How fast are the animations? Uh, how many different variations are there on the animations? It's all of the stuff that might be considered, you know, visual flair towards the end. It could be considered, you know, the real kind of polish kind of stuff. But in the first instance, if you can't hit a target consistently, then none of the VFX or none of the audio or anything else kind of really matters if you can't hit things. Um, so that's where the 3090 feedback comes in. And just following on from the, the we, we before me from earlier, this is all about collective cohesion. So this is the idea that every single person working together is going to make a feature greater than this, the sum of its parts. Um, much like the team that's in this image, everybody's working together to kind of, you know, deal with something that's much larger than themselves. The way I look at this is a bit like, you know, a, a conductor can't do anything without the orchestra, you know, much like I said earlier, the we before me kind of mindset. 
Um, in everything that we did on Hood, it was a bow and arrow kind of focus game. We had projectile behaviors and haptics that were done by design. We had hit reactions that were done by animation. We had hit boxes that were all the kind of gameplay and server programming. We had the network replication stuff. So this was, you know, shooting targets over distance and what that looks like and how it replicates to all the clients. That was from, you know, network programming again. We had all the uh, kill confirmed kind of impacts. We had crunchy kind of headshots. This was all from the audio team. Um, it's quite a visceral game. So we had blood impacts and surface materials. So this was all from VFX. And then we had UI notifications to tell you about your points, your score and the status of the game. So all of those things there, that's a cross-discipline kind of network of people that came together to make something that's much greater than, you know, any one part uh, could have done on their own. So the summary for the team is um, be pragmatic, embrace challenge and ambition, be a good listener and elevate the ideas of others. And then the last one is crowdsource contributions, but temper the feedback. So again, just be mindful, much like that example of the 3090 feedback, you know, the feedback that we got originally probably wasn't as relevant as it could have been. And this is for the final section is basically this is all about the project. So in the broadest possible sense, if you have a leader that's part of a team, there's a team that's working on a feature, let's say it's combat, it might be stealth, it might be any any one of a number of things. The project is multiple teams kind of working together uh, to feed into the project as a whole. So the first one is all about strong pillars, no filler. The idea here is you've got to have strong kind of clear direction of exactly what you want to do in the game. Ideally, three pillars, you know, the number three again, three strong pillars of exactly what's the type of experience that you want to create. In Hood Out Outlaws and Legends, we were doing something that was much like the Game of Thrones kind of style universe. Very dark, very dark medieval, um, very visceral, very violent. But at one point, the, the moment that you bring up, you know, medieval into the conversation, the Monty Python sketches get introduced in, you know, some design meetings. But unfortunately, you know, some people can become invested in ideas. And the longer that something stays in the game, possession is nine tenths of the law. People get attached to that idea. And by the time it's got to be removed, people have already become attached and kind of love that idea. And the reason I mentioned the Monty Python example is, whilst I'm not one for shooting down kind of ideas early, it was probably an idea that should, should have never been in the game in the first place, for example. Um, so it's just one of those that if you want to stick with the dark, visceral, medieval kind of tone, then Monty Python probably doesn't fit within that. So it's just to you know, make sure that that's dealt with early. Um, so leverage and inspiration. So again, I mentioned it briefly earlier, but we have a character in the game. It's called the Sheriff. That's the character that's on the screen. He's basically our, our objective carrier. Uh, so in the game, the objective is to sneak into the castle and steal the gold. In order to get the gold, you need the key and the key is on the Sheriff's belt. So you effectively have to sneak up behind him and kind of steal it. But just in terms of leverage and inspiration, the way we always chat about the Sheriff was much akin to Mr. X from Resident Evil. It's a really tall kind of character, head and shoulders above everybody else. Um, he has a slow walk, which makes him extremely intimidating, so it's much like Darth Vader. Um, he has booming footsteps, so the footsteps signify to the player the power that he has in kind of his feet, but also the, the relative location of where he is in the world. And we used to talk about that in terms of Jurassic Park's kind of water ripples. And all of the things I've mentioned so far, as well as a few others, are all ways to get the team on board with the idea and make it very easy to understand what's the type of thing that we're going to be creating because they can tap into something that already exists. Um, he has a terrifying voice like the mountain in Game of Thrones, so that's another inspiration. And he has the ability to one-shot kill people, so it's much like the clickers in The Last of Us. So again, there's five or six examples there that feed into the archetype of the relentless pursuer, you know, much like the Terminator, for example. But these are things that they're points of reference that people can look at and understand immediately, you know, what's the type of experience we're trying to create with this character. And that's exactly what he is. He's effectively our medieval Terminator. Um, the next one is all about the value first. So the idea being is that at any given time that people in the team should be working on what they think is going to provide most value relative to the goals, the intent, the direction, you know, the pillars, the overall experience. The reason I mention this one is because at a certain point in development, certainly towards the final third, you'll start to hear statements like, what's the biggest bang for book or what can we achieve within a limited amount of time? You know, what, what are the quick wins? You know, what are the low hanging fruits? 
definitely there's a time and a place for that kind of uh, you, you know approach. Certainly in the final third of the project, I think that's kind of sensible. But for the rest of the project, you should almost always be working on the one thing or the couple of things, you know, maybe three things, as I mentioned earlier, the, the magic number, the three things that are going to provide the most value to the experience, as opposed to doing the things that are potentially the most easy to do uh, at any given time. And it basically also means that everybody is working on realistically a consistent small set of stuff rather than trying to, you know, kind of skate off in different directions, trying to do the things that they think is going to be quick uh, rather than, you know, the stuff that's most beneficial. Um, the next one is about defining the problem. Um, so quite early on, this was in development. We have our uh, character again in the Robin Hood game. Is This is our kind of little John character. And you'll see that he has a hammer on his back. Previously, he never had a hammer. He used to have a giant javelin, so a, you know, a huge spear. You could throw it, you could impale people on the walls, you could target kind of pesky robin characters that were camping, um, you could one-shot people from far away, and basically he had an extra tool which, which allowed him to be you know, more of a force in the gameplay. That was an extremely popular feature, but at one point we took it out of the game, and that was a really unpopular decision at the time. And the reason being is because people loved the feature so much, they got used to it, it'd been in the game, we took it out, and all of a sudden that character didn't feel as strong no more. The reason we took it out of the game is because we were separating the characters into melee focused characters and ranged focused characters, and our John character had this weird kind of blend somewhere in the middle. So what we want to do is push him more towards the melee kind of route, which is exactly why he has the, you know, the hammer that's on the back. But a couple of weeks later, we introduced an ability for John, which I mentioned earlier, it's almost like a rage or a berserk mode where he's pretty much invincible uh, for a temporary amount of time. And when we introduced that, nobody ever complained about the spear ever again and still hasn't to this day. And the reason is, is because when we took the spear out of the game, we didn't empower the player anymore. And when we introduced this new ability, the players felt empowered to play as this character again. So we took the spear off them, we give them this invincible kind of rage mode. And the feedback was never the problem that we took the spear out of the game. The feedback was that we actually disempowered the character and the players wanted to feel empowered playing as this character. Um, so it's just one to keep in mind that what people say and kind of what they mean are two different things. And it's just be mindful that you know, you're trying to look for the hidden message in the feedback. We could have kept the speed in the game, for example, but that would have went against what we were originally trying to achieve with separate and different player styles and diversion in the characters. Um, the next one is the subtractive method. So this is the idea that, you know, in general, if you can try to remove things from the game rather than add in things, um, it's very expensive to add things to the game, especially in the final third. But in this particular mission, this is from Call of Duty in Bougainville, um, it's a jungle survival mission where the idea is it's supposed to be about focusing on your know, observational skills, you, you know, you've got low ammo, it's basically just about trying to survive as much as you can. So there's an emphasis on crouch and stealth kills, there's the ability to manually trigger waypoints, so we have a waypoint system in the game that tells the player where to go if they get lost. That was repurposed to signify where your lost teammate was because he's also somewhere in the forest. Um, you have persistent low health in this mission. So, you, you know, you're at danger of being killed at any given moment. There's lots of pre-existing trees and foliage and fog. You can see that in this image. All of these things previously existed, you know, um, in, in other missions or other Call of Duty games. And, you know, the limited visibility and the, the distant kind of silhouettes added to that fear factor, but also it didn't impact upon performance. So, you know, in terms of the assets that we used, the fog that was used, you know, exactly it was going to not uh, impact the gameplay whatsoever. Now, the reason I mention all of those is because every single thing I've just mentioned was a system or a behavior or a feature that already existed in the game. It was just repurposed in a different, uh, a different way to create a mission, which is a subtractive kind of mission, whereby it's an exotic mission using pre-existing you know lego bricks built in a different order within a limited time time scale um, and created quite a memorable experience without actually adding you know explosions and helicopters and so on this was effectively taking what was there and you know repurposing it effectively uh next one is love the player so this is just the idea that you know in in a modern day people can pay 60 or 70 pounds and get access to a subscription with you know hundreds of games on say for instance Game Pass. And 
in this day and age, ideally, you don't want to give the opportunity for players to play your game and kind of turn it off quickly. It should always be trying to keep people engaged, trying to have the best possible experience moment to moment. And this is where we love the player. If you keep in mind that on Hood, we had a stealth uh, kind of assets in the game. We had the ability to sneak up on guards, much like that's in, in the image on the screen. But this was impacted by, you know, the lighting system. It was impacted by the, the nav mesh, the pathing system. At any given time, any given discipline or any given person on the team could add to and or break any of these systems and ultimately lead to a bad behavioral or gameplay experience, you know, moment to moment. Um, so one thing to just be mindful of is just to be, you know, extra kind of testing just in general, anything that you add to the game to make sure that it kind of keeps in line with, you know, loving the player kind of experience and try not to do things that could potentially break core features of the game. So, for example, when the lighting would be broken in, in Hood Outlaws and Legends or the, the lighting wouldn't build properly um, straight away, the AI would not be able to function as they once would uh, uh, once did. And it's the same for the nav mesh. And anybody that picks up the game is probably not going to have a great experience with that. Um, so the next one, and this is the final one for this section, is just to celebrate your successes. Um, so the image on screen, again, this is from Call of Duty. Um, it's from the Midway mission. The idea being it's a, it's a flying mission. You've got to fly down, shoot some boats. Uh, they're kind of battleships out in the ocean. You've got to try and survive, destroy them, and then basically escape. Um, at one point during development, towards the end of development, it wasn't considered the particularly one of the strongest missions. And the, uh, it was open to the floor in terms of what would you do to kind of improve this mission. And a bunch of suggestions that myself and a few others made was to basically change the pacing of the game. Um, the, the, the tagline that we started with was Maverick and a Rust Bucket. So the idea being you're an ace pilot, but you're extremely difficult. Uh, you're extremely easy to kind of shoot down. So it's much like a glass cannon uh, in other games. We changed the pacing of the mission. We changed the way that the, you know, the, the, uh, play mechanics felt, how the gunplay felt, how it felt to have kind of bullets whizzing past your head. You know, the, 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 there was the threat of danger, but, you know, amplifying that kind of even further. And also things like as you were going down to shoot the boats, you know, how dangerous that would be. So we changed everything related to that. And what we came away from that was the team itself and the directors. Um, not only did the playtest scores kind of rise significantly, but everybody in the team was kind of praised for kind of pulling together and, you know, turning the quality of that round. And, you know, we're each individually named, um, you know, during team meetings and, you know, discussions and things like that. So a, a little kind of respect and a little credit goes a long way. So just in general, you know, try to, you know, praise the team, especially when it counts, uh, much like that. So summary with that section is to blend strong pillars with soft inspirations. Um, interrogate the feedback, but, you know, put value first where you can and subtract content. It's not always about adding new things because new things can lead to bugs. It can lead to additional work. And love the player, you know, and celebrate successes. So love the player, love the team. It's just about keeping in mind, everybody needs to make the best possible player experience uh, for both themselves and for others. And this is kind of my final takeaways uh, from this talk. So it's basically a cheat sheet. And if you take that message that I mentioned earlier, we're trying to foster a collaborative culture between mixed discipline peers, irrespective of team size, location, or project scope. Well, here is 21 suggestions uh, for that. Um, there's the six, uh, sorry, there's the seven for the leaders. That's the seven for the team. And that's the seven for the project. And on top of that, there is some additional kind of inspirations um, in, you know, things further reading, I would, I would kind of say for this. Um, there's a whole bunch of different stuff on here, but in, to, in the essence of kind of sticking with three, um, I particularly recommend Creativity Inc. in the bottom right hand corner. Most people have at least heard of it if you've not read it. Um, Leaders Eat Last in the bottom center by Simon Sinek is really good. And uh, top middle, there's a couple of GDC talks, um, you know, communicating across disciplines. That's a particularly good one. And that's everything I had so far. And before I take the, you know, the one question that I had, you'll see a bunch of names uh, that kind of appear on the screen. Again, just when I go back to practice and what you preach, there's a bunch of people that help put this talk together. And yeah, I just want to recognize, you know, those names and those people, because um, whilst I've, I'm presenting the talk, there's a lot of people that contribute directly or indirectly to it. Um, and one of the questions that I got, you know, ahead of time with this talk was just about, 
how do you know how much to take from other games? You know, the intent of other games, you know, what are the things that you should take from? What are the inspirations? How do you know what to take from them? You know, depend on the team, depend on the project, the budget size. So in the example of Hood Outlaws and Legends, we were looking at Born Arrow, Born Arrow mechanics and we had a fairly modest team and a fairly modest budget. So that's the first thing I'd probably start with, which is what is the relative, you know, budget that's within the team? If the budget is substantial, then you know why why not try something different? You know, especially if you've got if you've got the time, the resources, and the manpower to do so. But ultimately, it depends on you know first and foremost the feasibility of that. If you're going to take something like bow and arrow mechanics, which are well established in the third person genre and have been done by multiple games over multiple sequels, and they've almost refined it to the point of being you know the the, the de facto kind of standard it would be very difficult, but not impossible, but it would be very difficult to kind of start from ground zero and kind of go again with that. So my suggestion would always be, if you've got the time, the budget and the effort, maybe uh, maybe experiment, you know, see if you can do something new. Otherwise, I think for something as, as established as bow and arrow, you know, projectile based behaviors, at least stick with something that's kind of familiar, but try and find out, you know, where the areas that could be improved upon, you know, is it the feeling of the satisfaction of kind of firing the bow? Is it about kind of the reload animations? Is it about being able to do it whilst you're jumping in midair and sliding on the ground? It's basically how can you add or how can you, you know, improve that feature even more? But again, it's always dependent on the team makeup, the budget, the, the project scope, you know, for example, in Hood Outlaws and Legends, Robin Hood is one of four characters so the better that we make the bow and arrow, we have three other characters that also we have to keep in parity with that as well. So we couldn't put all of our time and resources into making the best bow and arrow ever, partially because we didn't have the resources for it, but partially because there's other characters that we need to factor in as well. Um, so yeah, in general, just kind of be smart in terms of making choices about what you want to take from other games and what you want to introduce. And uh, yeah, hopefully that helps. My details are just on screen if you want to get in touch with me. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that talk. Thank you.